Thanks, Ramsey, for that very kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here, ladies and gentlemen, at the Texas Heart Institute. Thank you to Joe Rogers, um, Dr. Razavi, uh, for inviting me. Great to meet up with old friends and new, as is under Warrens and um, other people, Mohammed, that I met today in the rounds. So today's talk is reliable computational approaches for cardiovascular medicine. Please look at the disclosures, funding by NIH, some consulting, and also funding by the Laurie McGrath Foundation. So I want to put a quick plug in for the idea that I think all of us have to be more and more aware of the integration, the convergence of computer science, digital medicine with clinical care and research. For this, I just want to quickly show that we've started a new program for training both engineers and physiologists and medics at Stanford. It's called the CHIP program. I co-run this with Alison Marsden. And the idea is based around a disease question in particular. We look at imaging, um, proteomics, genomics, chart data, anything you can think of for the goals of mechanistic and therapeutic discovery. The goal is to teach critical thinking and coding for, for doctors and to treat and to teach unmet gaps in medicine to engineers. So if anyone's interested, it's a two-year postdoctoral program. We'd love to take applications if you know anyone interested. So having said that, let's go ahead and start with some audience response questions to get us oriented. Number one. What do Americans most commonly die of? Sorry, a bit of a downer to start with, but that's question one. Question two, what do most Americans worry about the most? Number three, what does the American media most worry about? And number four, what does the media in other parts of the world worry about? Well, look, we're in the Texas Heart Institute. Obviously, the leading cause of death is heart disease and stroke. We know that. Cancer is, of course, not far behind, and these are fairly recent numbers, haven't changed much in the past uh, couple of decades. But what do people actually worry about? Cancer. Now, what does the media most worry about? Any thoughts? Terrorism. <laughs> and the order is the same. So heart disease, I think, gets about 2.5%. What about the media on the other side of the Atlantic? Also terrorism. So this is not just a US problem. So now, is heart disease still the most important in the most recent years with pandemics like COVID, et cetera? The answer is yes. Even at the depths of the pandemic, heart disease was still the largest cause of death and hospitalization. So what are the problems? What are some solutions I think that this is a much deeper problem than digital health, wearables, and AI. And I think computational methods can help with phenotyping, as I'll show you. Quick primer on what machine learning is. We'll talk a little bit about chat GPT and so on. And then I'll finish with subjects very dear to my heart, AF diagnosis and treatment, VT diagnosis and treatment, and how these tools all wrap together. And I'll do it through some clinical cases, and hopefully we'll keep it a bit interactive as well. So we're talking about the problem, but let me first show some phenomenal recent solutions. So in patients with few comorbidities in AF, the standard thinking is you can treat them by slowing the heart rate. So that ventricular rate is in the, let's say, below 90 at rest, or you can maintain sinus rhythm, but it doesn't matter. Recent studies show that is no longer true. We didn't have this data until the East AFNET 4 trial in 2,800 patients, multi-center, mostly European study that showed that in people who were relatively well, but had some comorbidity, treating rhythm early, maintaining sinus, substantially reduced the rate of hospitalization and the mortality rate. It was the first time this has ever been shown. It contrasts with what we have been taught until that study. So if you look at all the guidelines till 2020, it was rate and rhythm control, no difference. That is no longer true. That's a very important message. So this was in people who are relatively well. Remarkably, the same is true for people who are not relatively well. The Castle AF trial 
published in 2018, uh, Marush et al., showed that in patients with significant heart failure and ICDs, restoring sinus rhythm with ablation was substantially better at keeping people out of the hospital and keeping them alive than traditional treatment. And guess what? It doesn't stop at just any heart failure. The Castle HCX pub study just published last year in NEJM showed the same thing for patients with advanced heart failure. Dramatic reduction by ablation therapy in patients with AF and really advanced treatment, advanced heart failure for the endpoints of LVAD or heart transplantation or death. The hazards ratio was 0.24 for ablation. So the, with all these fantastic successes, what's the problem? The problem is, like everything we do, success is patchy. This is the result from Cabana. How effective is ablation? And the answer is 60% at one year is a good number. You could say 70, you could say 50, and depending on the patient, you'd all be right. It's about, it's better than drugs, but it is patchy. And so what does that mean? It means actually that not all our patients are getting the same benefit from the same treatment, even though they look very similar in clinic. This is from, Car from the uh, Castle trial. In blue, you can see the curves for people who had an AF ablation. On the vertical is the probability of event, which, as we said before, is hospitalization or death. You can see that at about two to three years into the trial, People who were both ablated, those who had an unsuccessful ablation, which means that the AF burden was more than 50%, had a much higher rate of death or hospitalization than people in whom the ablation was successful. It's somewhat intuitive, but it also means if we don't improve ablation we, of, ablate, of AF, we're actually hurting these patients in heart failure. We can go on and make the same case for patients with heart failure who get ICDs and biventricular pacing. These are classic studies now. This has made it to on the top, Moss et al., showing that patients with uh, receiving defibrillators had a much lower mortality than people who got conventional treatment. And then below is a similar trend for patients receiving biventricular pacing. Okay, How do we, though, separate out people that do and don't do well? Recent work by Matt Seeger and Rosavi from um, Texas Heart showed one way, just looking at the bedside, getting a score of frailty. You can show people who do really much better from ICD therapy, people with low frailty scores, you can see have a much lower mortality compared to people with high frailty scores. But how effective are these scores and risk profiles at identifying people that will and won't respond? it really makes a difference. We know that one third of patients, maybe a quarter, don't get better from biventricular pacing. We know that, it's well established. Okay, so you might think, well, that means a quarter of people aren't doing as well, they'd go to the hospital, we'll find better ways. It's actually worse than that. In this recent study of cost utilization, by Niraj Verma et al, that was just published two years ago, they looked at specifically that question. When people don't respond, they go to the hospital a lot because they're decompensating, they're getting more visits, they're getting repeat echoes, and so on. Therefore, the number of visits is six times higher for a non-responder than a responder, which actually translated into a tenfold increase in cost for people that don't respond versus respond. So if we could better identify responders, tailor therapy to them, and do other things for non-responders, additional therapies, maybe even AF ablation when, that's, when indicated, we could dramatically improve workflows and cost resource utilization. So how do we do that? How do we better respond, identify responders to AF ablation, bioventricular pacing, ICDs, and everything we do in cardiovascular disease? It's a problem, but it may, has big impact. So we know that disease presentations are highly variable two angiograms, the same disease, coronary artery disease. On the left, mild disease, distal circ. On the right, the widow maker's lesion. Presentations of the same disease, totally different. On the left, mild chest sensation. On the right, sudden death. So very different presentations of the same disease process. 
if we look at this in a, in a more nuanced way, this massively impacts therapy. Okay, so this is a basic case for any medical students watching edema. What are the causes of this pretty dramatic pitting edema of the left ankle? It's more like an elbow than a thumb to cause that pit. So obviously you think of heart failure, renal disease, other causes of volume overload, rarer things, SIADH, liver disease, lymphedema. Obviously, our therapies, guideline-related medical therapy, resynchronization, are going to do really well for heart failure, and they won't do well for the other causes of edema. We have to phenotype them. So that's an obvious case. So this one is a less obvious case. What's the ECG? I know it's only three beats. Sorry. I did that for aesthetics. It's AF, obviously. Okay. You can see for the med students who are watching, this looks like a P wave here, which is about less than a big box away from the QRS, but it's not present here. If you were to look forwards and backwards, it's not present. Therefore, although this is looks like sinus, it's a pseudo P wave. And in fact, the irregularly irregular QRSs give it away. So we think we know what AF is, but AF is many different diseases. The obvious one is some of it is pulmonary vein dependent and some of it isn't. In other words, in some patients, you can treat with PVI and they could be free of AF for years after one procedure. Other patients don't do as well. 50, 40% of people don't respond. If we could better phenotype these patients, it would make a huge difference. But this is the key problem, I think, in clinical medicine. One problem is better therapy. The other is, how do you choose people for therapy? The tools we have are actually poor at doing that. We think immediately of clinical trials. It's a great way of testing therapy in a defined population. But what's the defined population? You, this is true across all of CV medicine. Ischemia trial large study run by David Marin, multi-center, but David Marin at Stanford was the first author. We know that in stable coronary disease, whether you have conservative therapy with meds or PCI, the endpoints, which included mortality, were the same. No difference. But that's not the whole story. We've all seen patients who do much better with PCI, who weren't stable with medications and others that did just fine with meds. How do you separate them out? Very hard to do. But in the overall population, because you couldn't pick them out, you got this result. I've already shown you the same with AF ablation. If we were to pick them out, it would look something like this. This is a patient-by-patient -patient analysis for a totally different rhythm. I've chosen it deliberately to make the case. This is applies across everything we do in cardiovascular medicine. This is a VT ablation trial. The VT ablation was performed at time zero. To the left is days before, to the right is days after. Each horizontal line is the number of events of VT. So obviously here there's lots of, of events before the ablation and none after. These patients had a success. They would be this line that we all get very proud about and very happy with. The next group are people who had fewer events after. Great. So it's technically a failure because if you look at first recurrence, they failed, but they're better than they were before. Decreased burden. And the third group, there's more events after, so it's progression. How do you figure out from anything we currently do, which of the patients in that trial, this was Cabana, previously ischemia, will do well versus don't? We have to go back look at simple characteristics. All these patients met the enrollment criteria, which are typically strict. So they look the same in clinic, and yet they had very different responses. This, what I'm saying is sort of obvious to us, but how do we fix it? Do we look at chart? Is it age, gender, BMI? Is it the ECG for AF? So far, nothing's worked out. Is it structure? Is it genetics? Is it lifestyle? Putting these together is incredibly complex. That's the challenge. And that's where I think that computational medicine is going to have its biggest impact. So what is computational medicine? What's machine learning? And how does that compare with what we normally do? So what is traditional phenotyping? How do we normally fix this problem? You would take a group of patients and you'd say, do they match? 
what would you match them on? I've already said a few. Age, gender, BMI, smoking, things like that. How well does it do? So I pulled up a few cases. So this is a propensity match for this guy. You probably heard of him. King Charles III, male, born in 1948, raised in the UK, married twice, lives in a castle, wealthy and famous. You could pick some other criteria. Now, we searched, scoured the country for other people. Here's somebody else with an exact propensity match. Ozzy Osbourne, male, <laughs> born in 48. You can see it's a disappointing match. This won't give you the same form of outcome prediction. So obviously, traditional phenotyping needs some work. This is how we could do it computationally. So what is machine learning? I'll do it quickly. But there's basically three goals for machine learning. One would be, let's get groups of patterns which look the same. We could call that a phenotype. So the patterns, the groups of patients are similar in some way. Another goal could be, let's predict people that have something, that have AFib on the ECG, that will respond to ablation. That would be, so the first one of predicting patterns is called unsupervised learning. How does the data stratify? It's simple. The basic idea is something like this. If you looked at everyone in Houston and you looked at height, then adults and kids are going to segregate. If you now look at more than height, then the data will cluster. If you look at height and weight, then you'll get a bit of overlap in the middle and so on. So you could cluster. So this is the basis for many things that are really becoming quite powerful. Again, just for the sake of to show you how powerful this can be, this is a nice paper from um, uh, Sweat et al. in pulmonary arterial hypertension. What did they cluster? They clustered proteomic signatures in blood to show that they identified th four different clusters of data that just grouped together. And in fact, they found that those clustered had different response to treatment. So you could do that. There have been studies I could show you. Lion et al., Bianca Rodriguez from Oxford, looking at ECG for in hypertrophic myopathy patients, ECG wall, uh, echo wall thickness, and a few other features, identify people that would and wouldn't respond to basal blockers. So there's a lot of things you can do. But there's no guarantee the data will cluster. Maybe you'll identify different groups. Maybe you won't. If you really want to identify the groups who will respond, you have to do something different. You have to do something called supervised learning. You have to train a tool to separate the outcome you want. Is AF, isn't AF? Or will respond to AF ablation, won't. How does that work? The principle is easy. You take some kind of computational structure. You feed in the data. In this case, an ECG on its side, this one is more obvious that it's AFib. You can see there's no obvious P wave that's at the same interval before the QRS, and it looks like a wavy baseline. That's AFib. So you feed it in in training. The first time round, the network hasn't got a clue. It's untrained, and it guesses. And it guesses wrong. It says no, no AFib. The zero there is no AFib. What happens then? It feeds back and says that is wrong because we're training it. Do it again. In the process, it changes the internal weights of the network so that the next time round, it might get it right. And you do this not twice, but 100,000 times. At the end, you have a brilliant classifier. Now you feed it a new ECG and it correctly says AF or not. Now, this is a great model and there's lots of ways this can be used, as I'll show you. The big challenge is, did you get the label right? Are you sure that that AF is sinus and the other one is AFib? Because if you got it wrong, it's going to learn that. And it won't, and, or if you're not sure, like, this is not very good at saying, do we have a better way of, treat, of, of ablating AFib? Because we don't know that as trainers. So we can't train that. So this is the basis for chat GPT and other large language models. All they are, forms of supervised machine learning that were trained on words, sentences, paragraphs. What do we use to train it? Car is that thing on four wheels. Bicycle 
is that thing on two wheels, etc. So the training was the meaning and the input was the word. So when you've trained it a lot, it is really good at understanding language, but only within what it's been trained on. You feed in, and we've got a paper and review on this, complex medical notes. It's terrible, 50, 60% accuracy because it wasn't trained on medical data because of HIPAA, that data is not on the web. It's not publicly available. So that's chat GPT in a very brief 30 second interval. We can go into it more. Before we move on, I just want to point out some really major potential drawbacks that we need to think about. A lot of people say AI has to be explainable. Why? If it gets the right answer, why do we need to explain it? We don't really understand how the CT scan works. We use it. The difference there is the CT scan was designed based on known physics of when <clears throat> X-rays are absorbed or transmitted or, diff or diffracted. And we understood that it was, it was designed from the bottom up. AI is designed from the top down. You know the answer, just classify it. And because of that, it may end up making decisions for the wrong reason. This is a great case. This is machine learning to classify tumor, so malignant tumor of the skin, or a benign nevus. This was published in JAMA uh, Dermatology some years ago. It was exceptionally good, better than dermatologists. So everyone's saying thumbs up, you know, it's, that's another career path down the tubes. And someone said, not so fast, not so fast. What is it doing? So looking in detail, it turned out that the melanomas were marked by the pathologist with dots to point out where they should be focusing the eye. So the investigators went back and took off the dots and ran it through again, and it failed miserably. So it was really good. The train network was really good at identifying dots and less good at identifying the melanoma. This is an extreme case. And as you can tell, it's, it's a long time ago. They're much better now. But there can be things that are trained on which are not what you expect that can mess things up. Here's another horrible but great example. Amazon scrapped its sexist AI tool. This was four years ago. This was a hiring tool that was designed by and put into practice. And they found, boy, it's picking a lot of great people, but they're all men. So they went back to look why, and it turns out the minute it found women's college, it discarded the file. So this was shocking and it was scrapped. Then you think, wow, that's horrible. Why are people designing it that way? They didn't design it that way. The historical data was, you look at the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, even the 80s and 90s, predominantly men were hired. So all the training was successful hires were men. So it just propagated that bias. And so it is critical that without knowing it, if data we bring in is historically biased, those will be propagated even in 2024. This is a good example. Again, this is a recent study from Texas Heart, Cotter, Mihail Chelyu, and others looking at what happens if you look at AF outcomes in people of lower or higher socioeconomic status, household income, SES. And what they found was what we sort of would guess it's tragic, but mortality is highest in the lowest socioeconomic group and lowest in the highest socioeconomic group. And the use of tools that could reduce mortality like ablation are the opposite. Again, we're not surprised by this, but if you feed that data into an AI model raw and ask it to predict who will do well from AF ablation, it's going to say people with a higher household income because the data was biased when putting in. So this is critical in everything we do, and it's really causing us to rethink data collection, data collection venues. Do you only collect data at Texas Heart, Stanford, you know, wherever? Or do you have to go out to community hospitals? Do you have to go out to other venues um, where people get medical assistance? And obviously, you have to do the latter. Can AR be applied broadly if it's trained in a narrow group? No, it cannot. 
Um, and so there's a, there's also a science being developed on that. So having gone over again briefly, sorry for the speed, having gone over some of the basics of AI, how it can be used and pitfalls, I hope we all appreciate when you see an algorithm in a paper, and they're coming out routinely every couple of issues now, you can look to see how was it trained? Was it then tested in a totally independent set, which is what you want? Something tested in Texas is tested in California, in New York, in Missouri, where I did my training, et cetera. Um, is it trained, tested outside the US? What was the mix of people used for training? Similarly, what kind of data was used? These are all really important questions to understand if the tool is likely to be something you want to look at again, or whether you think it's already inherently limited. So atrial fibrillation, I'm sure this group knows lots of the videos playing, which is beautiful. Massive problem, 20 to 30 million people globally. Uh, we've already shown that it actually increases mortality because you can show by treating it, mortality drops. And in some parts of the world, this is a study by Prash Sanders from three years ago, it's actually the most common cardiovascular hospitalization ahead of MI. And when I think about it, that could be true even where I am, that we see a lot of people, AFR, VR, you know, pretend, all sorts of reasons. So it's a big issue. The video on the left is from a wonderful project. I recommend you look at it if you have the chance, the Visible Heart Project. It's the inside of a saline-filled porcine heart showing what AF is. Nooks and crannies of the normal atrium, and it's just wriggling like a bag of worms. So you can imagine what that does to rhythm. You can imagine what that does to blood clotting. Clots can form in those crevices. All of it sort of comes out of what AF is. So let's talk through a case. This is a 65-year-old man with palpitations for a couple of years. Unfortunately, not captured by ECG. Tiredness. Past medical history, not a lot. Mild alcohol use, couple of glasses a week no rheumatic fever, normal thyroxin. These are, again, for med students, these are the kind of routine questions. Also, is there LVH? So look, hypertension, maybe get an echo, no sleep apnea, associated increasing with atrial fibrillation. Diabetes is one of the CHADS VASC risk scores. Echocardiogram showed an EF of 52%. And if you look at scores, modest, CHADS VASC score one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Medications are reasonable, hydrochlorothiazide for hypertension, lisinopril, fine. Examination, borderline hypertensive despite those medications, weights probably a little high. Pulse was regular, so suggesting sinus rhythm, not a lot else. This is today's ECG. So I don't know if anyone can read it from where you are. Again, for the med students, you've got an, uh, a regular set of QRS complexes at a rate that's within range. It's, uh, we just look, one, two, three, four, about five big boxes, so 60 beats, a bit little faster than 60. And if you look at the QRSs, they're narrow, which is less than three small boxes, 120 milliseconds, with a P wave in front of everyone at the same spacing, which is normal. So that will be sinus rhythm. So that's what we have. So the question would be, how would you next evaluate our patient? Number one, start oral anticoagulation now for presumed AFib. The patient has palpitations, presume it's AF, and start monitoring at the same time. So let's not waste any time. That's one approach. Number two, record an ambulatory ECG for days. Number three, implant a device and record an ECG for months. Number 4D, do an AI-enabled ECG, and E, other. So the broad answer for this would be something like B, because you can't assume that palpitations are AFib. There's lots of reasons people feel their heartbeat. Sometimes, actually, sinus rhythm. They just feel it pounding, like before you take an exam or something like that. Ambulatory ECG gives you a greater chance to pick it up, because you tend to get these things sporadically, as we've said in this, in this gent. Implanting a device is a bit aggressive. You could, if you really were, like if he's getting syncope, you would consider that. Is there intermittent AV block? And what's this D? What's an AI-enabled ECG? So let's talk about that. It's a new set of studies 
that's been really promoted beautifully by the Mayo Clinic group. Very clever. It comes off the basis that all AF that's intermittent, like any disease that's intermittent, comes and goes. So if you had a, so everything we capture is stochastic. You never really know what the true burden is without a continuous monitor. Case in point, this in the bottom left is a complete implanted monitor tracing for one year. So day one to day 365 of somebody, of two people with AFib. The one in blue has it in a, this is real, has it in a block which lasted from day 70 to 150. The one in red had it essentially every day. Both of them had 20% AFib. Okay. If you monitor the, the patient in blue here at day 50 or here at day 200 or here at day 300, you're convinced they have no AFib. Whereas the patient in red is going to be picked up almost any day of the week. Big problem, because you're obviously wrong in the patient in blue. And because it's a block, maybe that's the person at risk of stroke. We don't know, but you missed it. So how good do you have to be? Only as good as your comparator. We can't implant devices in everybody with palpitations. So the Mayo Group said, how about you take a sinus rhythm ECG, sinus rhythm ECG, and you train it like I've shown. And you say, okay, we've got 500,000 at the Mayo Clinic. Some of those people went on to get AFib, some of them didn't. So you train the network and say, these sinus rhythm ECGs correlate with AFib and these don't. Then when you've trained it, you run it on ECGs it's never seen before. It was incredibly accurate. And so in this study, there was an area under the curve, which is a measure of accuracy of about 87% for picking up future AF based on today's sinus rhythm ECG. It's incredible. Now, other studies like one from Jag Singh and others at, at Mass General show it may not be quite as good when trained in that way. So, But still, this can be improved. Imagine the beauty of that. People come in, you see them once, 10-second ECG, and you can predict whether they're going to have AF. You don't have to do the implanted recording. So that would be an AF, an AI ECG. The next big question for this chap is, what's the risk of stroke? This is from a very old slide from 1988 paper in the journal Stroke. This is what things used, people used to dive, these massive clots in the left atrial appendage. You can see the size of these things, a centimeter or more. The rate in people unanticoagulated is about 5% a year, and it's predicted by risk scores. We've all heard of Chad's VASC. The recent guidelines that just were published a few weeks ago suggested three or four risk scores, Atria, Garfield, Chad's VASC. We could go into them, but all of them have an accuracy of 60%. They're just not very good at predicting stroke. Okay, so the question would be, what do you do when you identify somebody at risk? There's anticoagulation pills, and then there's a variety of interventions. One is you can put something inside the left atrial appendage, which you've shown here. This is actually an amazing and shocking picture. A uh, human patient, left atrial appendage with clot in it. Imagine if that broke off. You could put something inside to prevent anything leaving the appendage. So easier said than done, because if you look below, these are the shapes of from MRI of human left atrial appendages. There are different names given to these, the cactus shape, the cauliflower, or windsock is maybe the easiest to, to close off. So you could close them off, and these are some devices. So it makes a difference if somebody is at high risk. How do you find out? So this is our question. The patient's AF burden on 14 day zeo patch is 32%. His risk of stroke is best assessed by A, Chad's vast atrial or other scores, straight off the history, that's all you need. Two, whether AF is paroxysmal or persistent. Persistent means it's basically continuous. C, AI enabled analyses, and D, other. So show of hands for A. Show of hands for B. Show of hands for C. So most people went with the board answer. Good job. You would use risk scores, even though we know we're in, they're imperfect. I put B for a reason. We no longer believe that 
paroxysmal well, AF has a low risk for stroke. The risk may be a bit lower than persistent. It's debated actually in EP circles, but it's not so clear. So any AF equals potential risk for stroke. You go with not necessarily the amount of AF, but things like CHAS-VAS score, um, which includes heart failure, hypertension, and so on, or an AI-enabled analysis. So we did this study a few years ago, and we said, okay, the amount of AF doesn't count. Does the, does, do the patterns of AF count? So we did in a, in a pilot study, people with implanted devices that told you exactly how much AF they had. And they said, instead of looking at 20% or 40% AF, let's look at the patterns. And we found that by looking at AI, using AI to examine the patterns, we pushed the predictive value up from 0.5, so flip of a coin for Chad's Vask, to about 0.7. So not perfect, not good enough, frankly, to be used clinically, but better. Could you use more data? Recent work by Patrick Boyle at the University of Washington, great young bioengineer, said, let's look at the structure of the left atrium by MRI. And so that's something that they were able to use for MRI, for AI analyses, to show that that could predict stroke. So then finally, the patient doesn't like his paroxysms of AF, which you rate control with metoprolol. He asks if we should consider antiarrhythmic drugs or ablation. What would you recommend? A, rate control is sufficient. B, ablation procedures have a class one indication now for people with his kind of AF that comes and goes. Or C, AI methods may help predict. So the broad answer would be, for someone like him, you do ablation early. I just want to make the point, I showed it in the first couple of slides, there's new data that actually the earlier you control rate, uh, rhythm, sorry, either by drugs or ablation, the earlier you do it, the better you are. So leaving somebody on rate control, particularly if they have relatively early stage disease, is I think a thing of the past. So new guidelines push early rhythm control, drugs or ablation. So how can you predict if our patient is going to do well from ablation? We know it's indicated, but only 60 or 70% do well. So we looked at this study. This is a series of AI studies that we did. And the question was, is it AF patient history, age, gender, et cetera? Does imaging by MRI help? Or does looking at patterns of AF electrical activity help. So we did a series of machine learning studies where we added these different features together. This was work done by Tina Bacon, a phenomenal young faculty at Stanford, who has a K award and also Caroline Roney, also great faculty, um, real rising star at um, King's College London. And basically the answer is adding imaging really helps a lot and adding electrical features helps. I won't go into the data except to say that many studies have now reported this in many groups, and I think we should change the way we evaluate who gets an ablation based on these data. History is good. It's better when you add some aspect of imaging. The studies that we've done show it could be MRI or CT scan, possibly even echo features, and so on. Um, I'll just show this is some interesting work by Ruben Feng in our lab, who said, Looking at imaging is great, but it's really hard to segment these images for AI models. So he said, what do people do in other fields of life? So he looked at what does Pixar and companies that do computer graphic animation do? And he said, they don't go and trace your arm and say, this is what it does. And it doesn't do other things. They actually model the elbow joint and say, this is a hinge. And they model other joints and see that you have more flexibility. And then they were able to code that. And so you end up with these things called geometric primitives. So he did that for the atrium. And he said, look, the atrium is a big round ball and the veins are tubes sticking off it. And in this way, he came up with, a, I thought, a really great approach to automatically segment. We're using it. It was published last year. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. I wish I didn't have to, but I do. Um, so I'm going to just uh, go forward and move forward to ventricular arrhythmias. So how would we use AI for that? So no surprise to this group, ventricular arrhythmias are a problem. Inside of the heart in VF, no contraction. 
defibrillation, much better. So it's really important that with the life-threatening ventricular rhythms, we act very quickly, and that generally means defibrillation. It's really hard to identify who needs defibrillation ahead of time. This is in our classic slide, and the brief nugget is that in the overall population, the rate is fortunately very low, one in a thousand, 0.1%, which in a US population of 320 million is about 300,000 a year. They're not all VF, but currently to the best of our information, that's about right. So the prevalence is huge, the rate is very low. How do you pick those people out? You can't go door to door. <laughs> Conversely, people who are very high risk at this institution and other tertiary centers have a very high rate of VTBF, particularly they've had it already. And those are the people we put in our trials and treat, but unfortunately, that's a fraction of the total burden. So how do we deal with that problem? It's a real issue. So let's take it back to basics and let's look at resuscitation. So this, I hope this video plays, is kind of a unique video, TE, of somebody actually getting CPR. So this was pretty effective CPR. You can see the ventricular wall really being deflected. You can see there's probably very good um, cardiac output with this, with this uh, CPR. Okay, so the question for the audience is, the survival rate, despite what I showed you, for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is A, 40 to 49%, B, 30 to 39%, C, 20 to 29%, D, 10 to 19, E, 0 to 9, and it can't go any lower than zero, ladies and gentlemen. So show of hands for A, B, C, D, E. The answer is actually E. It's really horrible. It's going to be, I mean, far better here because there's more hospitals than patients in this, in this block. So you're going to have phenomenal medical care here. Seattle is a very is a center that has great CPR because their EMS system is highly evolved, other major metro areas. So that leads on to the next question. Which of the following locations gives you the highest chance of surviving out of hospital cardiac arrest? A, big city, sort of gave that one away. B, rural area. C, at home. D, because there are people there, presumably. You're not out alone all the time. D, casino, E, airport. Any A's? Any B's? C's? D's? E's? So the reason for this is a real number, by the way, that the casino, because the airport has AD's, but they're not watching your every move. Whereas in the casino... <laughs> Um, home, this has been studied. There's, there was a home automated defibrillation trial, AED trial. It was called the HAT Home HAT trial. And that was by Bardi and Allen. Actually, it was a wash because even though there are often people around, they often are too scared to use it. They're not well trained. It's tragic. Rural area, there's no one around to help. And big city is actually also a good answer. Okay. Because of the time, I'm just going to skip. Uh, the, the details of the history, just to say that we have to intervene early. Currently, the paradigm is people are seen because they may have heart failure months, weeks, and days preceding their event. But it's really after the event that all the action happens, CPR, resuscitation, and then all the other eval. We have to change that paradigm because many people will not make it past the event. And so this is an editor, um, a review article uh, I wrote a few years ago with Paul Wong and Jim Dorbert. Duke. And basically, cloud coordinated res resuscitation is already here. I'll show you that briefly. So you hear about something, people descend on you without you having to make a call. Going back, wouldn't it be great to predict? But that means we need to have algorithms and data, which goes back to the prevent. So this is easier said than done. I'm going to again skip because of time. Prediction of imminent events would be great. If you knew somebody was going to arrest one minute from now, that would be actually pretty great. You could lie them down, make a few calls, accelerate EMS by those critical few minutes. What if you knew two to five minutes? So this was a very nice AI study using ICU level data from PhysioNet that was able to predict hypotension 
or VF five minutes before it happened. I've not seen a follow. There've been many studies like this. I've not seen follow-ons showing generalizability, but again, it would be a phenomenal thing. Um, just a quick plug, again, in the interest of speed, AJ Rogers, phenomenal young attending in our group who did a very nice AI study looking at specialized signals in the heart, using them to predict uh, VTVF in our patient uh, database. And we did this prospectively, and that was published in CERC Research a couple of years ago. Interesting data using MRI ahead of time to look at not just ejection fraction, but regions of the ventricle which have fibrosis. This has been a story for many years, but AI could help put it together in a way that the naked eye can't. And then finally, this business of crowd-coordinated resuscitation, this is actually real. This is being done in Europe, possibly because of liability not being such a concern, but it's being done in Europe and Sweden. Somebody is alerted to a cardiac arrest. Drones are sent with AEDs on them to rural areas. And the median time to arrival was only a few minutes. You need a bystander network. The first paper, I just wanted to show the first paper was actually seven years ago now. And these were the first 12 patients. So I thought that was just sort of an incredible thing. So in summary, this is a time of tremendous advances, but I think the biggest limitation, frankly, more than the next great cure for heart failure, which is important, is who best responds? Because then you could focus all your attention on them, and then everybody else could be the subject of focused research and better trials and discovery and cellular therapies and so on. Computational methods can really help by computational phenotyping. I hope I showed that a bit. Um, they can also provide novel diagnostics. And I hope I also showed their, showed their pitfalls so that when you read and scan these papers, you can immediately see if something is worth a second read or not. And then the biggest challenge for this is actually not the tools. I know there are some very, very fancy tools, XG boost, gradient boosting, ensemble models, so many. But it's really getting the data where you absolutely categorically know this is right and this is wrong. AI is great at separating AF from non-AF. It's not so good at deciding who will respond to ablation or not. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank everyone in the group who did all the work. I've called out a few, but it's really a huge, it's, it's more than a village. Thank you very much indeed.